We're going to be reading 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. So may we all rise in the reading of God's word. <clears throat> when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? If you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves are wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. Lord, we come to you today gathered to hear the words of our pastor and allow the words to just uh, soak into our brains and we understand and we just we, we thank you for this life in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. all right well this passage of scripture uh, as you might have noticed is pretty straightforward uh, it's pretty simple it's pretty easy to understand Paul is telling us not to take brothers in the church to court you got that pretty clearly from the passage? Okay, good. Let's pray and go home. Uh, well, since you all came this all this way, I guess I should come up with a little bit more to say about this. Uh, but once again, Paul is responding in this letter to issues that were taking place in the church of Corinth. We've seen him already throughout this letter addressing uh, several different problems within the church. The first few chapters of this letter to Corinth, he had written to them about the issue of division in the church, the sort of petty disagreements uh, comparisons, grouping themselves, uh, identifying the, uh, uh, along the lines of their preferred Bible teachers, all of that was covered early on. Then in the last chapter, Paul uh, wrote to them about another issue that was going on, and that being the member in their church who was openly involved in a uh, sinful sexual relationship. And so he wrote to them about how they were to address that. And now Paul writes to them in this chapter about another issue that was going on. Church members in Corinth, apparently, were suing one another. And once again, Paul is outraged that such a thing could be going on. He says, beginning with verse 1, When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? In essence, Paul is saying, how dare you do this? Now, this is a real problem in Paul's mind. Now, most of us, hopefully all of us, have never actually taken someone in the church to court before. So you might think, well, this doesn't really apply to me. I don't really need to pay attention to this passage too much. But uh, in the course of Paul responding to this specific issue that was going on in Corinth, he gives five arguments to explain why they should not be doing this. And so I think these five arguments Paul gives will be quite instructive to each one of us, even beyond this uh, specific application. And so as we work our way through the text, we're going to focus mainly on Paul's reasoning here and see what we can learn from it. So I'm just going to give you uh, each of these five arguments as we go, and then we'll look at the text and see where it, it comes out in Paul's writing. So we begin with verse 1, where Paul gives us the first of the five arguments. Paul writes to them that interpersonal issues between brothers in Christ should be handled within the church body. That is the first of Paul's five arguments given in this passage. He says, you should not be going to court against one another because these kinds of disputes are supposed to be handled within the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 1, he says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Notice that last phrase, instead of the saints. Uh, clearly, Paul is implying that these kinds of interpersonal arguments and disputes ought to be handled within the church. Now, before we go any further, I want to clarify what we're talking about and what we're not talking about. Because when you read a passage like this, uh, you might think that what Paul is basically saying is that the courts uh, should never be consulted, that 
uh, the legal system, the government should never be uh, brought in to deal with any issues going on in the church. But Paul is referring here to civil cases, not criminal cases. As Paul is going to specify toward the end of this section, the specific issue at hand seems to be fraud. Okay, there's business dealings between two church members, perhaps, and they've gone south. There's some sort of financial dispute taking place among these members. He's not talking about things like murder or abuse, uh, nothing like that. In Romans chapter 13, Paul teaches that the government has rightful authority to punish those who commit crimes against others. So in the case of a crime being committed, uh, the governing authorities should be involved. I want to make sure right at the outset this morning that I clarify that point so you understand the difference. If someone comes to me saying they were abused or hurt in some criminal way by someone else in the church, my first course of action would be to call the police. Uh, we would hand that immediately over to the authorities. We don't handle criminal matters within the church. That is the role of government as given by God. What Paul is talking about here, again, are civil disputes between two parties. So think about uh, the kinds of things that are on Judge Judy. Is that show even still on? I don't know. Uh, but if you've ever watched that show, this is kind of what we're talking about, where two people are having some sort of usually kind of petty dispute, uh, bickering over something typically involving money, and it's an issue that they cannot resolve on their own. This sort of situation is when Paul says the church should give a judgment and should settle the matter. You should not be going outside uh, to the courts of the world. Now, I know we just looked at Matthew 18 last week, but once again, it applies directly to this situation. So just to remind you of what we read there, Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 15, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now notice how Jesus begins that instruction. He says, if your brother sins against you, this is what you should do. Now, why wouldn't that instruction apply in the case of being defrauded? Well, it does. If your brother sins against you, including if he cheats you out of money, you are to go to him first and confront him with his sin against you. If he doesn't listen to you, you involve a couple of other folks from the church. You try to work it out amongst a small group, if the matter still isn't resolved, then you bring it before the whole church. So Jesus has already given us instructions about how we are, are to handle situations like this. Paul is simply reiterating to them what they should have already known from the teachings of Christ. But instead of following that process and handling the issue within the assembly, this church in Corinth, they were going to church to court uh, with one another to deal with their disputes. Once again, by the way, in this passage, as in the text from last week, we see that there is a clear indication that the church should have authority over each Christian who is a member. And in this case, the two parties are instructed to bring this matter before the leadership of the church and then seek mediation and submit to whatever the church rules, whatever is decided. Now, this doesn't make us a cult. Okay, that might be something else you're thinking of, why this seems a little bit controlling and uh, well, no. Uh, you know, as your pastor, I've never tried to tell you how to live your life uh, outside of the teachings of Scripture. I don't want to control your life. In fact, since I've been a pastor here several times, uh, I've had different people, some of you, some who some aren't a part of our church anymore, uh, come to me and ask questions about like major life decisions, like should I move here? Should I take this job? Should I change careers? Uh, all sorts of like major life issues like that. Should I get the surgery or not? And if you've ever asked me a question like that, you know that my response is almost always, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm in my 20s, bro. Like, come on. Uh, I don't have any sort of specific authority or, or wisdom uh, to deal with those types of issues. Now, if you're asking about something spiritual to which the Bible speaks, then I will direct you to those passages of Scripture. But I have no desire to tell you how to live your life, uh, how to make your daily decisions and that sort of thing that Scripture doesn't speak about. If you're asking me my opinion as a friend, I might give it to you if it's something I happen to know something about, uh, but my being your pastor doesn't give me any sort of unique uh, wisdom or authority over those issues. So don't let this idea of the church having spiritual authority over you 
make you feel like we're trying to dictate how you are to live in all the particulars of your daily life and decision making. We have no desire uh, to control people like that. But clearly, the church does have legitimate authority over its members in terms of spiritual accountability. We saw that last week. Uh, We hold each each other accountable to follow the teachings of Christ. And as Paul lays out here, there's also authority that the church has to settle interpersonal disagreements among members. So that is the first point that Paul makes. The church should be handling these issues in-house rather than going outside to the courts of the world. And Jesus already gave us detailed instructions on how we are to go about that. Next, Paul continues with the second argument. He says that there should be no reason to go outside the church to settle these things because there should be people within the assembly who have the wisdom and understanding of justice needed to settle these disputes. There ought to be people within each church that have enough wisdom, that have enough understanding of justice to mediate an issue like this. I mean, what does it say about the church if nobody there is capable of acting as a mediator, if you have to go outside to unsaved people to settle these issues? Paul says, beginning with verse 2, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, Are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? So, if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? Notice Paul's line of reasoning. He says, you in the church, you as Christians, ought to be able to handle these trivial disputes among brothers because, as you know, we're going to be judging the world someday. We're going to be judging angels. So, of course, you should be able to judge matters of this life. Now, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, up until 10 seconds ago, I had no idea we'd be judging angels someday. Uh, That's news to me. But now that I know that, uh, yeah, of course, if we are going to be doing that in the future, and that's going to be our role, it makes perfect sense that we ought to be able to handle issues of this life. There are, in fact, several passages of Scripture, by the way, that indicate that when Christ returns to rule and reign over the world, you and I, as Christians, will be given authority under Christ to judge the world. And apparently, as Paul says, this includes judging angels, judging over spiritual beings. Here are just a few texts that mention this. Daniel 7 verse 27 says, "...the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him." Uh, Jesus said to the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2, The one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as with earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. So Jesus says, just like I've been given authority from my Father, I will give authority to my followers uh, to rule and reign over the nations. Similarly, to the church of Laodicea, Revelation 3.21, Jesus again speaking, The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And then again, lastly, Revelation 20, we read, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, Those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their forehead or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such. The second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So several passages in scripture talk about this, that as Christians, you and I will be given authority to judge and to rule when Christ returns. And so Paul is saying, essentially, you ought to get practice. You ought to be handling, you ought to be capable of handling, uh, judging between issues in the church 
Now, back to our text, verse 4. Paul says, If you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? In fact, Christians ought to have a greater understanding of justice than the judges in this world. We have the Holy Spirit, after all. We have Scripture to guide us towards true justice as God sees it. And we as a church should have a desire for a deeper resolution in these disputes. We aren't just like the world's courts who are interested in uh, figuring out who is wrong and then punishing that person. No, we're going to be concerned with the spiritual issues that are beneath this surface problem. We're going to be working towards not just a resolution to this dispute, but it's a true reconciliation between these two brothers. And so it makes no sense for us to be dragging each other off to court. People within the church should be just as capable, if not more so, to settle these disputes between members. So that's Paul's second argument. Next, verse 6, Paul continues, But brother goes to law against brother. Paul reminds these Corinthians of the unity that they have as brothers in Christ. And so essentially his third argument is that taking someone in the church to court is saying that there is something more important than Christian unity. The church is a bigger deal than you. The kingdom of God is more important than any of my problems that I might have with you. And by elevating my need for justice for myself, by prioritizing my desire to get what I feel I'm owed, I am minimizing the importance of the unity within the church. Taking someone in the church to court is implying that there's something more important than Christian unity. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the, va- of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith. Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus teaches us there to seek first, as our top priority, the kingdom of God. Don't worry about all these things, referring to our basic needs. God will take care of your food. God will take care of your clothing. He will provide for you. You keep your focus on Christ's kingdom. When brothers in the church are suing one another, we are seeking first all these things. The things that Jesus told us not to be worried about. And we are putting the kingdom of God, which is supposed to be our primary focus, as a secondary issue. Taking someone in the church to court is saying that there is something more important than Christian unity. Next, verse 6 again, notice the end of the verse. Paul says, brother goes to law against brother. That's bad enough. Then he says, and that before unbelievers. Here's Paul's fourth argument. We should be concerned with the reputation of the church in the community. Paul is concerned with the testimony that this church has in Corinth. He's grieved at how this behavior is making the church look to the watching world. Jesus said that the world would know we are his disciples by the love that we show towards one another. What does it convey to those watching us bicker and yell at each other in court? This kind of behavior was bringing shame to the name of Christ in Corinth. How important is the reputation of Christ to you? How concerned are you about the impression people get outside the church when they 
watch your conduct. Now, this is something that all of us ought to be thinking about. Do people at work know that you're a Christian? If not, why not? I mean, we are supposed to be trying to reach people for Christ. But if they do, if your neighbors, your coworkers know that you're a follower of Christ, what kind of impression are they getting about Christianity as they observe your life? Do they hear you using the same profane language they do? Do they see you demonstrating the same lack of integrity and honesty that everybody else does? Do they see you displaying a bad attitude towards authorities just like the rest of the world? Do they watch you involved in arguments? Or do they see something different in you? My mom used to remind us of this often as we were growing up. I have a brother who's uh, two years older than I, and so, of course, we fought at times, as brothers do. And I remember several times being rebuked by my mother for fighting outside in front of the neighbors. And she reminded us that all of our neighbors know we're Christians. They see us dressed up on Sundays, hopping in the van with our Bibles. They know that we're Christians. And how do you think it looks when they hear you and your brother yelling at each other and fighting, when they hear the screaming from our house, and we're supposed to be followers of Jesus? Now, I'll be honest, as a 10-year-old, that didn't really matter much to me, uh, I'm sad to say. But I hope as an adult we can see the problem there, that there is a, a real problem when people outside the church see us bickering and fighting with one another. It's a blot on the testimony of Christ. There are people in your life, maybe neighbors, maybe coworkers, maybe friends, who have never darkened the door of a church. You and I interact with people that have never read two verses from the Bible. In your life, your example may be the only glimpse of Christ that they ever see. The way that you treat others, the way that you speak, the attitude you have, may be the only idea they ever get about what it means to be a Christian. We should be concerned with the reputation of Christ and how our behavior either damages or adorns the gospel. And certainly, two Christians in the same church taking each other to court is a blight on the testimony of Christ in that community. Lastly, argument number five for why Christians shouldn't be taking each other to court. Paul says to them that they just shouldn't care that much about money. He says to them, you really should just consider letting this go. So somebody in the church defrauded you. You've been wronged. Better for you to just get over it and forgive them than to bring a lawsuit before the world. Now that might sound shocking at first. Like, really, Paul? I mean, really, you expect us to just receive the wrong that was done to us? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 7, To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? That seems a bit extreme until you read the rest of the New Testament and you realize this mindset is on every other page, it seems. For example, 1 Peter 2.19, For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Peter says it is a good thing in the eyes of God when you keep your eyes on the Lord and suffer unjustly, when you just take it. Verse 20, For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Notice, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. This is your calling, brothers. You're supposed to follow Jesus' example, right? Well, how about the example he left when he was unjustly tortured and murdered and he took it? When he could have called 10,000 angels to slaughter his enemies, but instead he suffered unjustly on the cross and with his dying breath he said, Father, forgive them. And Peter says, go and do likewise. This is what you've been called to do. Christ endured this suffering so that we would have an example to follow. And we are never more like Jesus than when we are wronged by someone and we just accept it. We don't demand retaliation. We don't demand justice for ourselves. We simply forgive. Here's a statement that will probably sound objectionable at first. The love of Christ at work in us 
will at times require that we allow ourselves to be taken advantage of. This is perhaps one of the most radical teachings of Christianity. But this is what it means to follow Christ. At least sometimes, you should just accept the defrauding. You should just suffer unjustly like your Savior did, your Savior did for you. That's what Paul says. That's what Peter says. Let's see what Jesus himself has to say about this. And he takes it even a few steps further, believe it or not. Luke 6, 27, Jesus said, But I say to you who hear, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Notice what he says there. If somebody takes your cloak, somebody steals from you, not only should you not sue them, Jesus says, you should give them your tunic too. That's like, you know, somebody steals, uh, steals 20 bucks from you and you say, here, have another 20. And can I just say, I'm not sure, based on the teachings of Jesus, that Christians should be suing non-Christians either. I mean, Paul's talking about lawsuits within the church. What Jesus is saying here seems to extend far beyond that. I'm not sure that it's really a Christian attitude to be suing anyone. Verse 30, Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. A Christian who isn't able to forgive someone who has wronged them doesn't make sense. If every wrong done to you has to be made right, if you demand justice anytime somebody uh, treats you in a way that is unfair, that is an indication that the gospel hasn't really sunk into your heart and mind. You're not thinking as a Christian. Because when you realize all that God in Christ has done for you, when you recognize the great love displayed for you on the cross, where you owed a debt of sin that you could never afford and God wiped your slate clean, he released you from that. When that reality sinks in, it will have the effect of transforming the way you think about others who wrong you. Of course I'll forgive them. God has forgiven me of infinitely more. Remember the parable of Jesus about the guy who was forgiven a debt of like $10 million, but then he refused to forgive somebody who owed him 20 bucks? That's what it's like for a Christian to sue another Christian. I mean, are you kidding me, Paul says? Why not just suffer the loss? Why not just be defrauded? You're a Christian, right? Hasn't God forgiven you of so much more? Why then can't you extend that forgiveness to people who wrong you? Forgiven people forgive others. Back to our text, verse 7. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not suffer wrong? Why not be defrauded? And then verse 8. But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. This is almost like an afterthought for Paul. He's so upset about the fact that Christians are going to court against one another publicly, uh, bringing shame to the testimony of Christ, that he hasn't really addressed the fact that these people are defrauding each other. And so after spending the first seven verses telling the folks in Corinth, stop suing people who defraud you in the church, now he turns to the other side and says, you guys who are doing the defrauding, you knock it off too. I mean, for goodness sake, stop it. How are you doing this to your own brothers? Cheating them out of money in the church, your own brothers in Christ? What's wrong with you? In fact, as Paul goes on to say in verses 9 and 10, you're not acting like someone who has been saved at all. Notice verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Notice in that list, thieves, swindlers, 
These are people who defraud one another. And Paul puts them in the same list as homosexuals or people who worship idols. Paul says this is not the behavior of people who inherit God's kingdom. In other words, Paul is saying to those who are defrauding others in the church, are you even a Christian? Because Christians don't do this. True Christians with the Holy Spirit within them don't behave this way. We'll get to more of that next week as we'll look at verses 9 through 11 in more detail. So then we've seen these five reasons that Christians should not be suing one another. First, interpersonal issues between brothers are supposed to be handled within the church. Jesus gave us clear instructions about this. Second, Paul says there ought to be people within the church who have the wisdom and understanding of justice necessary to adjudicate these disputes. Third, taking someone in the church to court is suggesting that there is something more important than Christian unity, that you getting whatever you feel is owed to you is a higher priority than the unity of the body of Christ. Fourth, Paul says we should be concerned with the reputation of the church in the community. And this kind of public display of arguing with one another is bringing shame to the name of Christ. And number five, Paul says, we just shouldn't care that much about money. Why not suffer the wrong? Why not just be defrauded? That would be better than bringing a brother in the church to court. Now again, most of us, I hope, aren't taking one another to court. But can I encourage all of us to go at least a step or two beyond just that bare minimum of don't sue one another. Let's try to create a culture of peace and unity within our church. As Romans 14 says, So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Part of that is following the protocol provided in Scripture for handling issues that may come up at times. Uh, so often in the church today, and even at our own church, sadly this has happened many times, Someone will stop showing up, and we have no idea why, because they didn't want to talk to anybody about it. They had an issue with somebody, they were upset with something that was done, and rather than address it, they just leave. They don't even try to work it out. Unity is better achieved by following the teachings of Christ, confronting one another when sinned against. Even if you confront someone and you realize it was all a big misunderstanding, great, you've gained your brother. Pursuing peace means... We don't ignore issues. We don't sweep things under the rug. We also don't talk bad about one another behind the other person's back. And certainly, we don't take one another to court. When there is a conflict, we go to the person and try to work it out. If it can't be worked out between you and that other person, then you bring a couple others from the church in to settle the matter. But all the while throughout that whole process, the goal should be reconciliation as brothers in the Lord. May God help us to have a culture of peace and unity and forgiveness. Let's pray together.